man, last week um, I was in East Texas. And so I uh, had my son with me. We had some things. My brother had passed away, and so we were working towards his estate and getting that kind of taken in order. So I took it as a road trip for my, me and my son to uh, be able to spend time together. And so we drive out to East Texas. And um, Sunday, we're going to head back. But I'm like, I want to get some fellowship in. And so my, my son and I, we went to a church that we've never been part of and caught the message. Now, that message was in Matthew, where he, went, where he started off in the genealogy of Matthew. And so if you ever read the genealogy of Matthew, it's the part where you kind of just run through it real quick, you know, but it's a like, chapter long. And then I turn on to catch Hope City's message, and there you got Dr. Mike going through genealogy. And, um, man, I was like, I, there was a couple different things that were going on. One, I was like, Lord, what are you trying to show me about genealogy? Because today we're going to look at genealogy again, you know? And I'm, so I'm praying, Lord, okay, you got my attention. The second thing was I was rejoicing that it was Dr. Mike that was unpacking a very difficult chapter in the scriptures <laughs> than me. But anyhow, that's for whatever that's worth. But that being said, I know that there was a lot of information given. And one of the things that we do um, at Hope City is we want to go through the Word of God verse upon verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. And what that prevents us from doing is avoiding difficult chapters like chapter 10. It causes us to have to focus and say, okay, Lord, what is it that you would want to speak? And as you realize the sovereignty of God and the dispersion, um, it's a significant piece. God is in the details. And so we take the Word of God, and we're going to bring it. And we understand that was a lot of information, but I rejoice um, that God is just, His Word is living, and every word is significant and important. Now, that brings me into chapter 11, which we're going to look at today. And I want to preference chapter 11. An interesting thing about chapter 11 is that this is chapter 10 and chapter 11 are not in chronological order. The, the truth of the matter is that chapter 11 actually happens before chapter 10. And that begs a question, why? Why would God put it that way? Why not just list it in chronological order? Why, why take this? And that brings me to an emphasis that as I was asking the questions and kind of looking at this and, and asking the Lord, Lord, what do you have about genealogies? What do, I, what do you want us to know? What is it that you're showing? And then second is, why isn't this in chronological order? And what I realized is that what you're seeing in chapter 10 was you saw the sovereignty of God prevailing even though there's resistance. So in chapter 11, we're going to talk about the resistance. But in chapter 10, you have God's will as being accomplished regardless of the resistance. And that should bring us to a very encouraging point. And this is the point, that God is in control, and he wants to put his emphasis that my will is going to be accomplished. So even when you see man's will looks like it's prevailing, even when you see the world kind of going in, in craziness, you can have the assurance, and that's what we should be pulling from the text, is this assurance that God's will stands. That God's purpose stands. Matter of fact, as we unpack, unpackage this, the name of the study today would be called An Enduring Legacy. And what we're going to find is the rising up of the Tower of Babel. We're going to see this tower. We're going to see all the reasons why for this tower. And you're going to see a guy who we talked about last week named Nimrod who rallied the people of God around his message, around his cause, around um, what he had to say. And they all rallied around him to build what we're going to look at here. And what we're really going to see is we're going to see the world's man. We're going to see a man that has a message that resonates in the heart of the world and the world's responding. But then we're going to see another man because this is going to end with another man who is God's man, who obeys God, and the entire world is blessed by it. So you have one man where he brings in the world um, rallies around, hears, and the message speaks, but the memorial goes nowhere. And yet then we find another man who hears God, obeys God, serves God, and the entire world finds its blessing. So I think we can understand the application of today's message as we break it down. Which one do I want to stand under? Which one resonates within me? Is it the world's man or is it God's man? And what we're going to see is the reality of the faith 
relationship and the stewardship in which God calls us and invites us into as we unpack this together. So with that, can you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, where I will be reading out of the ESV version. Um, now the whole earth had one language. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me do this. Let me pray. Let me pray before I start touching this. Father, I thank you for uh, uh, just I, the message went out in first service, Lord, and I saw um, the fruit of that. And so you have a living word that you want to unpackage, you want to speak into our hearts. And I would not be so presumptuous to not come before you humbly before the body of Christ and before you, my King, and ask you, Lord, would you take this moment and would you open us to the word and the word to us? Would you speak? Would your name be exalted and lifted up, Lord? Would you bring the truth of your word to our heart and to our being? And may it be having the application in our lives so that our lives are your story. God, we come and invite. Come and have your way today. Open us to the word. We commit this time to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So now the whole earth, in verse 1, had one language and the same words. Now I want you to notice that that is an interesting way of putting it. That one language and one word. What is that speaking to? And so everybody spoke the same language, but this double emphasis of one word, yeah, one language, one word, spoke of something even more significant. It speaks to culture. And so that what we're seeing here as the stage is being set is that this group of people, the, the whole group of people, right? We're in the third generation, but this whole group of people have not only one language, but they have one culture. They're in agreement with the language. They're in agreement with the culture. They are walking in this thing. And so as we start to unpack the culture, we're going to start to see a significant issue with what's happening here and why God, who cares enough, is going to intervene and in what God's going to do in a solution. So the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now, here's something I want you Bible students to know. I was a, John Corson used to always say that, and I always loved that from him uh, when I would hear his messages. And it says, you Bible students, here's something. Every time you see in the scriptures, especially in the book of Genesis, when you see people moving in the east, it means they're moving away from God. And I want to build that picture up for you. I want to give you a little bit, if I can figure out how to turn the page here, um, and give you some examples of what I'm talking about. The Garden of Eden. When the Garden of Eden happened, which, where, where was the angel positioned? He was positioned to present them, preventing them from the east. So they came out, they settled out on the east side, there was, there was the sword, the angel with the sword, and didn't allow them back in, because they no longer had, there was a break in, a broke in the relationship, and in the opportunity that they had in the garden. Also, it was God's provision to prevent them from moving themselves into a state of eternity by taking of the tree of, 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 of life. If they would have been in that cursed position and took of the tree of life, there would have been no opportunity for redemption. So God, in his mercy, does not let them partake of that, but drives them out of the garden. And so now they're outside the garden on the east. Um, later on, Genesis chapter 13, we're going to see when Lot left Abraham, where did he travel? He traveled eastward. Where did he find himself? He found himself in the pathway of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's sons, by his concubine, Keturah, were sent away from his sons, Isaac, eastward. When um, here in this context, we see that they settled east, means that they were drifting or moving away. Their, their city of rebellion, because that's what we're going to look at, was set in the east. They were set away from, um, it picks a universal rebellion they're moving away from God. They're not following what God said. They're moving away from God. And then Jacob fled his homeland um, when he fled from his, bro his brother Esau, right? When he was fled from Esau, where did he go? Eastward. So eastward, when you see in the scriptures, what you're really getting is a picture of moving away from God. And this is where we're, as we unpackage this verse upon verse, we start to see this picture being developed. One language, universal. We're in agreement. 
We have one language. We're all speaking. We're all one culture. As we look at, move it to the east. I'm walking away from God. So we're finding a culture that finds its identity apart from who God is. Okay? That's what we're seeing. Now, we're going to get into the heart of the condition. Because it's going to say three let us statements. And when we unpack these three let us statements in the text, you're going to find what is really motivating them. So, first one, verse 3. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Notice how they're making a comparison to a brick and a stone. A stone is not a man-made object, right? But a brick is man-made. And so what you say is, let us come and make these man-made works that we're going to use to establish ourselves. We're going to make bricks. And so what you have is this comparison in the scriptures between the brick and the mortar, or the brick and the stone, and the stone being a God thing, and the brick being a man-made thing. So we're finding a work that is to be celebrated that is rooted out of man's engineering, man's capability, man's ability. What are they going to do with these bricks? I'm glad you asked me that question. Let's look at the text. Verse 4. They sung, come. Verse 4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops to the heavens. So the intentionality of these man-made works is to celebrate, hey, instead of uh, we're going to build a community, and in our community, it's going to be beautiful. In our beautiful community, we're going to create this great tower, uh, tower that is of to the reach to the heavens that's going to celebrate, celebrate man's achievement. We're going to worship. What are we going to worship? We're going to worship what we bring to the game. We're going to worship how great we are. We're going to create a place, and it's going to be spiritual, and it's going to be wonderful, and we're going to celebrate. Why? Well, glad you asked me that question. Let me show you. The next verse says, And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So, why did they feel like they needed to be dispersed all over the face of the whole earth? Because that's exactly what God had said to Noah and his sons when they came off the earth. Art. But instead of obeying, there's resistance to God's word. And why they want to resist, what they want is to make a name for themselves. This story right here really is the same story of today. I submit to you that every issue and problems that humanity faces is found in their need for validation and for valuing itself apart from its creator. It doesn't work that way. What the Tower of Babel is about it is about the kingdom of man saying, let us be gods. Do you remember the lie that came from the very beginning that Satan subtly spoke to Eve? He says, God does not want you to be like him. That's why he's keeping you from good things. He knows that your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Well, guess what? We're not God. And we were never created to carry the burden of God. And neither can you carry the burden of God. Only God can. But what you're having here is trying to find one's identity, purpose, significance, and meaning apart from the Creator. And that's exactly what humanity moves around in. They attempt to find their identity, their purpose, their significance. Make a name for yourself. But you try to do that apart from the reality of who you were created with, you will end up with Babel, chaos, confusion. Because you were created for a relationship with the living God to walk in his purpose, his beauty. This is not unusual. We're only in the 11th chapter of this book. And yet I can show you how we've continually, when God says something, the enemy immediately comes and he resists it. Take, for instance, after the fall, and, and the story of the book here, right, as we unpack this story, and all of, from Genesis all the way even to Revelation, you find one story. You find the prevailing grace of God pursuing, regardless of sin. You see the invitation of God to come into alignment and relationship with him. But you see this constant resistance. So when Eve 
was deceived and Adam rebelled. The fruit of that was that the glory of God departed from them and their eyes were open and they saw their nakedness and their relationship with God changed. It was no longer the same. They no longer had this intimate contact with God. They no longer had the cool walks in, the, in paradise, in the garden with God, in exchanging and having that intimate kind of beautiful relationship. That's been severed. It was broke, and they knew that was broke. And in that brokenness between the relationship between God, it then affected their own relationship in which Adam, who rebelled against God, said, I would rather walk with Eve than you, God. What a mistake if he would have only known. Because the very relationship he wanted to, his sin now came in and drove division into the relationship. And so then God's grace gives a word prophetically speaks, and he says, from the seed of the woman will come the one who will crush the serpent's head. You will bruise his heel, but he will destroy you, Satan. And so what was Satan's game plan? Here's a word that was given from the seed of a woman. I will pervert the seed of a woman. And so he introduces and has some of his fallen foes, his contemporaries, if you will, to whatever extent, the angelic beings, and they tried to create a whole new race of people that became part angel, part man, called the Nephilim. The perversion and the violence were so severe and everything became so destructive that God had to say enough and he had to destroy, start over. That's where we're at, is the start over. But you see, the enemy heard the word and is trying to prevail against it. Do you remember Cain? Cain was said, you will be a vagabond, but what you find that comes from him, you'll be a wanderer. As he walked in rebellion to God, resisted God's word, and stayed in his injury and hurt, and determined that he would separate himself from God. Because when he says, I will not stand with you, I will not walk with you, I will not. I'm, I'm, I'm being driven from you. And what it is, it's not that you're driving me from you, it's he's blaming God for being driven instead of repenting. God is extending the hand a fellowship still, even in spite of. But he says, I don't want your game plan, God. And then from Cain's generation comes the cities that were built from his. And what do we get? We get technology. We get um, uh, agriculture. You get music. And so you find all the cities that are being built. And what it's saying is that man is trying to find its purpose and existence apart from who God is. And so you see this picture and then we have Canaan, who we just looked at a couple of weeks ago, where Canaan's son, or Ham's son, Canaan, was cursed, right? And what you find is the first city that's mentioned here that's being built up is coming from Ham's line. Resistance. When God speaks the word, there's resistance. Let's build a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed. Let's build a name for ourselves, lest we are obedient to the word of God. And that's a problem. Because this community was trying to find itself apart from the reality of who God is. And God had already dealt with that once, right? So then our text tells us that they're resisting to the word of God, verse 5, and the Lord God came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Now, there's very humanistic terms being applied to God, and I believe that's for relatability. It's not like God wasn't there or didn't see or didn't know. But in a moment of time where it came to a point where God needed to interject, God says he visited what I want you to understand about God is God's timing is always perfect. But here's the other thing that I want you to know. God sees. God sees. A piece that I failed to mention to you is that this was discussed last week where the builder of this city was a guy named Nimrod. Now, he's an important guy to understand because Nimrod, the Bible said, is a, a guy that was the world's guy. He is a guy that he was, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a man of renown, as like you got in Genesis where we had the Nephilim. He was a man that people gravitated, and he was the author of the building of Babel. 
And so he had a message that communicated to the masses that they gravitated to. And I want to unpackage that for a second because we have an understanding of that. When you say, let us make bricks, let us do this, let us build a name for ourselves, let us immortalize ourselves, let us worship what we bring to the game, who's that in alignment of? That is none other than the enemy, the adversary, who the Bible describes as Satan. First John tells us, he says, Do not love this world or the things of this world, for the things of this world are not of God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are of the world, not of God. So here's what I want you to hear today and understand when you evaluate this message or any messages that you hear. When you evaluate information or culture language into your life, I want you to use this as a test and to evaluate it because it will tell you which spirit is it coming from. So if that doctrine appeals to the lust of my flesh, what is that? To fulfill my desires, food, whatever what makes me feel good physically, the lust of the eyes, the things that appeal to my, my, what I like to see, the things, beauty, coveting, leads its covetousness, but what is it to see? It's attractive to me. I want to take that because it's beautiful. I love that. That's my precious. Or the pride of life. That which gives you validation, what makes you feel like you are something important or significant, that validates you, your pride. The Bible says that Satan appeals to those areas in your life, that he's going to come to you and he's going to package a system to give you identity and purpose, but, it, but you won't find the centering of that in the purpose of what God has said. You'll find that you're the center of that. And so if your religious doctrine puts you at the helm, that God's some sort of mystic bellhop ready to answer all your prayers then I'm telling you right now, you're listening to a lying demonic spirit. That's demonic. But if the doctrine that you hear exalts the person of Jesus Christ and leads you to liberty, life, purpose and meaning, vitality and love, beauty that exalts God, then you're talking about being a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. So Nimrod had a message of power, of strength, he appealed to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the people grabbed around it. But my problem that I have is that we're only talking about the third generation from Noah. And when I was studying and processing this, my spirit was grieved. How are we there so quickly? How are we in a city and a people and a culture that speak one language and one culture that are actually walking in rebellion to God, trying to find their identity, their purpose, their meaning, their existence, their substance, apart from the reality of who God is? How did we get there? Why did we get there? And this is where I see we have to guard truth. We have to stand in truth. We need to make proclamations of the reality of who our God is, just as they should have been doing to their children. Malachi chapter 2 has this accusation against the tribe of Judah. And in that accusation, God says to them that the thing that they have done wrong, and I think this is around verse 15 or 16, he says, I seek a godly children generation, but you have abandoned me. And you abandoned me because your hearts are filled with violence to your marriages. You see, the testimony in which we have, and, and when I was going through, um, a, a, there was a Bible college class I was taking, and one of the things that the lecturer had communicated was out of Mark chapter 4, and it's always stuck with me, and it's found in four, Mark chapter 4, verses 24 through 25. And he says, take heed to how you hear, for how you hear, it will be measured back to you. To who much has been given, or to who hears, much more will be given. But to he who does not hear, even what he does have will be taken from him. And the principle there is talking about the reality. The reality that you, that God's word, God's truth requires a proper response. And if you don't respond properly in obedience to what God's saying, then even what you do have can be taken from you. And I can tell you that if if people find themselves in hell that had the knowledge of God, they're not going to find the knowledge of God in hell.
But even so, we can find the same thing, what God requires from us. And so in this third generation, somehow they move past the story of God's love, God's grace, God's purpose, God's meaning. Somehow that wasn't communicated to their children's children. Somehow it got perverted or not became important. And instead, man became elevated. So that today we can squabble about whether you're born a male or a female as though you can really have any control over that. Trying to find your identity outside of the things that God has declared is folly and foolishness and destructive. Not only to you, but to all of society. And so Nimrod had a plan, and people gravitated to it because it made them feel good about themselves. But if you want to feel good about yourself, then feel good with a God who loved a sinner. And his grace is there. That's a whole different kind of picture. And so when God comes and visits, it's because God cares and God sees and God's going to now act. And he's going to act because there's rebellion to his word that's going to lead to a general mass rebellion like it did before the flood. You see... Verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us come down and confuse their language. You see, when man gets together, guess what happens? Is things able, discovery able? Is man able to accomplish great things? You bet. Today, we have all kinds of things that are on the forefront of coming forward. We are making great strides to be able to take away the death, the gene death, as Dr. Mike was talking about, how, um, how they're figuring out that sequence. Perhaps maybe in the near future, we're going to be able to show you how to have immortality. Hey, we can implant things into you that is going to help you to rewire and allow you to tap into that super strength, that super ability. Or Hey, you know what? Language, no longer an issue. For every language, all you need to do is come into a conversation with my little app, and then we'll do 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 and we can all speak the same language. We can bring in all the greatest minds. We can bring in all the greatest talent of the world. Let's get together and let's build the tower and show who we are. You see, Nimrod is a picture of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is in the wings. And when he comes, he will sell a bill of goods that the world will, this one world, one nation, let's get together, all. We're in agreement. And as we watch the seasons and the times being set, we realize that we very well could be. But here's the deal. Our circumstances are uniquely different because we have a relationship with the living God and therefore have an opportunity to steward. What God did right here, he says, let's confuse their language. Now that is a judgment. You see, he was calling them out to disperse. He was calling them out to fill the land. And if you want to understand the why to that, you can actually find this. I had this, um, I was in this commentary or in this discussion with Pastor Matt, and he pointed a verse out that, um, that I thought was pretty darn good. Acts chapter 17. So if you look at Acts chapter 17, Paul's writing to a group, or he's not writing, he's getting up and communicating to a group of people in Athens to talk about, um, to introduce them to God. And as he's walking through the place, he sees that they have idols all over the place. Every God, it's named. And they even had one called the unknown God. And so he says, hey boys, let me tell you about that God. And he used that as a jumping point. That's where we get this text. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. And for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of the heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, so that they should seek God. And perhaps fill their way towards him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. 
And so the dispersion was also a part of isolation. And if they would have guarded the message as they were dispersed and celebrated the reality of God, then guess what? You wouldn't have had all of these things introduced and it would have compartmentalized. But every single one of these groups had a responsibility to protect what they knew. But did they fail? Did they protect? Were they proclaimers? Or did they go after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the things of this world and say, we can make a name apart of ourselves. We're going to serve gods that fulfill my fleshy desires. But those cultures were ripped with violence and perversion and destruction. We live in a culture that's not in agreement with the word of God, but we live as ambassadors. Amen. We live as a testimony, as living epistles known and read that we serve a mighty God because we have transformed lives. God did not just save you to walk on streets of gold. He saved you from a life of ruin and spoil of sin. He saved you for a life that is filled with the beauty that expresses his kingdom, love, joy, peace. That's the invitation in which we're walking in. That's the invitation we have. And the world needs that message. The world needs to see that message. They need to see hearts that have been changed and transformed by the power of a living God because they hold to the truth and they stand. So God did confuse their language and he did disperse the people as he commanded. And we see that they had a responsibility to protect what they had and what they didn't protect, what they did have was taken from them. So likewise, it's the same truth today. Now our text moves us into Shem's genealogy. We see the problem. We saw the problem of civilization, trying to find identity and purpose apart from God. But now God is going to give you the answer, and we see the pursuit of God for humanity. And then what we see is we see this in the genealogy of Shem. Now I'm not going to go through this verse upon verse uh, for time constraint today. But I want to simply point out to you to later on look at this. This is different than Genesis chapter 5. Now this genealogy line of Shem is even different than what we previously saw in chapter 10. Chapter 10, he lists out the genealogies and cities that certain people had and different directions that they were established and wh where the dispersion went to. But in Shem's genealogy, we have the genealogy of the firstborn. Now, we know that Shem was the one, he says, blessed is the God of Shem. Why? Because in this genealogy, Shem was going to hold fast to the true God of the scriptures, the true God of the creator of the world. And because of that, there's going to be a blessing to all. Because... God wasn't going to be snuffed out. Let me pause on that for half a moment. Did you know that each one of us, because you are a possessor of a relationship with the living God, you're light and darkness. You're hope. I'll make it again. And the clearer we walk with God and the more we allow God's authority in our life, the more we honor God, the more we worship him, the more we love him, the more we are transformed by him, the clearer the story becomes in your life. But I want you to know that even when your story is not clear, God is still perfect. And he can still work. Because when we look at Abraham, we also see that this whole story is leading to another man named Abraham, who is a man of faith. And Abraham's faith, he says, all nations, including us, are blessed because of his faith. See, now we have God's man, and God's man obeys God. But here's what I also want you to see in this genealogy as we break this thing down. is that it's different than chapter 5, because in chapter 5, he says... Um, this person was born, he had a son at this age, he lived this long, he died. And it goes every time, chapter 5, it always says, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died. And the reason why is because it's emphasizing what happened at the curse. The day you eat of this, you will die. And they died spiritually, they died physically, death. And so this is an emphasis of this. But why not emphasize this here? Because as you kind of read this, when Abishad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah, just like you know, Genesis 5. And Arbashad lived after he fathered uh, Shelah 403 years, and I had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived, Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. In verse 15, and Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years. See, this just continues to go down the line. But you know what's missing is that it does not emphasize death. And here's the reason why. Because this generation, these people are under the covenant, the rainbow. Now let me speak to that for a second. You talk about something, again, warfare. You want to understand warfare, though? Our rainbow, no, let me rephrase that. God's rainbow was trying to be hijacked. 
Every time you see that rainbow, it shouldn't bring you to a different thought. It should bring you to the faithfulness of our God and the faithfulness of life, the faithfulness of promise, the faithfulness of covenant. And this was in response to people that worshiped God with an abandonment. And God says, never again will I curse the earth like this. You see, God has given an invitation to life, not death. So death is not emphasized here, even though they did die. But it's not the emphasis. And so you see this comparison to bring us to a place to realize that God's covenant is a covenant of life. And so then the deal moves from verses 10 through 26, we get to Terah. And Terah, um, it gets dialed in even more. He says, now these are the generations of Terah, verse 27. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of, uh, of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. So you're getting some information here. He's now dialing it in because he's going to bring you to this guy Abraham. Abraham had three brothers, right? And one of these brothers died. His brother, he had his, his brother that died had a son. It was his nephew, Lot. Lot's going to be part of the story building up. But here's the thing that I love. I love that the Bible is setting up God's man, and God's man cares about his family and his extended family. Let me show you something else about God's man. He says, And Abraham took Nahor and took wives, and the name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Malchah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Isaac. Now Sarah was barren, she had no children. So here you have the man of faith, the man who's going to bless the world, he's being set with a God-sized problem. He's got a wife that can't have children. And yet God's going to make him the father of all nations. From his seed, all nations will be blessed. You see, it doesn't mean in life that we have God and we're following God that there's not obstacles or adversities or difficulties. But what you know is that when you're walking in obedience to God, you have a God-sized solution for your God-sized problem. See, those God-sized problems in our lives are there to create dependence upon our God, not trying to find your identity or purpose or your ability apart from God. It's not how good you're going to be. It's not what you're going to bring to the game. It is what God brings to the game, and you responding to that in an act of worship. That's the picture. Amen. Terah took Abraham his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah's daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth together from the Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and the days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. See, so that is the Abrahamic covenant. But what I see is that there's a consistency in the pattern of Scripture. I'm going to invite the worship community to come on back up as we kind of close on these thought processes. And we're going to give an opportunity. We always want to end our messages with an opportunity of response. See, a lot of us are carrying God-sized problems. And God wants to be in the middle of that. And so coming up and in a declaration of prayer, that's an opportunity. Here I see that Abraham became a blessing to the whole world because he obeyed and because he believed. You become a, a blessing to every scoop, scope, not scoop, but scope, that you're in when you carry the testimony of Jesus Christ. That relationship, that covenant, though, is that's our stewardship. Now, here's what the Bible teaches us, like I said in Mark chapter 4. I draw near, well, this is out of James, but it says, they draw near to God and he will draw near to you. See, I'm to build my foundation and my home on the reality of who my God is. I'm to stand on that and I want to declare that to my children. I want to declare that to my wife. I want to declare that to the scope of influences that I have. I want people to know. And the more I press into who God is, into his purpose, and I find my identity in Christ, not apart from Christ, when I find my identity is lost in Christ, I come to know God even more, which drives me even harder. And so also you. And when we set our heart upon the things of God and we say yes to Jesus and yes to your way and yes to your kingdom, yes to your, your language, God, yes to you, 
You're letting God write his story of beauty in your life. And people read it. They see it. We're proclaimers. And when you do that, you bring a blessing to whatever scope of environment that you're in. You bring the blessing? No, let me rephrase that. God brings a blessing because God is shining through you. And that blesses you. You see, that's how we can change the culture. That's how we can have influence. It doesn't really matter what direction the world goes. It doesn't matter who our political landscape is. You know what matters? Who our God is and that people would see a God who sees us and working in our lives because we have surrendered and yielded. We carry the testimony. We press in. And the more you do that in community, the greater that is. But the more our community does that apart from God, the greater the darkness is. But for us... We don't have to fear. For us, we can celebrate the privilege that we get to live in such days as this. That we get to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we can know God in an intimate level here in this place as we press in with faith. As we press in and trust faith, believing God at his word that responds with action. That's our invitation, friends. Would you stand with me?